Sounds like most of us are pretty familiar with verbal behavior, I would guess, since most of us are VCBAs, but um, for those who aren't, I'm gonna give a bit of a primer on that, and so I apologize um, for those of you um, where this is redundant, or um, well, hopefully it's a good refresher, a reminder, and I know this kind of stuff is helpful for us um, from time to time. So, many of us being familiar with behavior analysis, just to kind of put everything into context, um, being the field of psychology, concerned with analyzing and modifying human behavior to produce socially significant outcomes. So we know that our goals of our interventions are not just to change behavior just for the heck of it, our goals are to change behavior in order to um, make some sort of change that's gonna be um, helpful, socially significant for the individual, and, and that can speak from a variety of um, things or a variety of things that are socially important to us. So again, um, early emphasis or, or misconceptions about behavior analysis may be that we just change behavior for fun of it, but really it's more um, about changing behavior so um, it makes important um, improvements for an individual's life. Knowing that, the focus being on, um, on behavior, we're not, we're not trying to change individual traits about a person, so we're not here to change the autism, we're not here to change who a person is, uh, we're trying to increase their social interactions, we're trying to increase the frequency of their vocalizations, we're trying to increase the length of time that the individual may be on task, we're trying to increase the amount or number of um, appropriate interactions an individual has and decrease the inappropriate interactions that an individual may have. And the beautiful thing about behavior analysis, and I always talk about this with my students, is just being just the really fascinating fundamental point, as we all know, that um, behavior is lawful. Um, behavior occurs because of the way that the environment is arranged. And I, and I think, and I always like to think of this as a very optimistic viewpoint. And I don't know if anybody would maybe maybe want to take a guess for why this is an optimistic viewpoint um, with trying to especially work with individuals who have challenges um, in speech, language, communication, problem behavior. And think about behavior being lawful, why is that optimistic? Any ideas? I know it's early. Yes, cool, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We can, there's always something there that we can do to help the individual um, change his or her behavior for the better. So I like to think about it as there's no such thing as an unteachable student, right? Now, it's easier said than done, right? But there's always something there that we can do to manipulate to help things be better. And um, it just takes our own detective work to be able to do that. So I find that to be a very optimistic um, viewpoint. And, and that's one of the reasons why I love behavior analysis so much. So again, many of us being BCBAs or BCBAs in training, um, this is this is list of um, common misconceptions that I hear that I always like to talk about in workshops. And so many of these may be familiar to you guys, but I just want to go over them briefly. Um, as we know, behavior analysis is more than just a treatment for autism. Um, it is it is about changing behavior to be socially significant along um, multiple different domains. One of my favorite examples when talking about the applications of behavior analysis is. Um, you guys may have heard of the giant African pouch rats that sniff out landmines in, in Tanzania. Is anybody familiar with that um, nonprofit project? That's a great example of the far-reaching applications of behavior analysis. So it's not just something that's used for individuals on the spectrum. Many people talk about how behavior analysis can only be used for behavioral programs, so to reduce challenging behavior. Um, we're going to spend the first half of this um, talk today, at least, um, talking about ways in which we can increase appropriate behavior, so it's not just for reducing challenging behavior, as we know. Um, many have said that ABA is only done at a tabletop. You'll see some of my kids in the videos might be interacting with somebody maybe over a table, but a lot of it does involve or can and will involve um, other parts of the environment as well. And the, the places in which this treatment is applied is only limited by our imagination. But as we know, because we're here at this workshop, we know that behavior analysis cannot just be done by anybody. We need to have the explicit skill set to be able to apply these principles in order for us to be successful. And we need to be able to understand and recognize the limits of our own competency to be able to say, hey, maybe I need somebody else to come in and help me out to apply these things. People have argued that ABA produces robotic behavior. Hopefully some of the videos, again, we'll show today in our research will help to um, combat this rumor, I think that ABA, when done well, can produce very natural responding behavior in kids. 
Um, you won't see any edible food reinforcers in any of the videos that I'm going to show today. Sometimes they may be useful in getting kids to respond, and Dr. Wendt may have some examples of teaching early language um, using edibles. But the goal, again, is to get people to be able to respond and behave under the natural contingencies or the natural outcomes that um, behaviors produce. Um, behavior analysis is not antiquated, it is emerging, evolving, and um, if anything, very modern and progressive. Um, and it's the fundamental viewpoint, I think, in which educators should view behavior change. And it's not just one tool in the tool belt, um, it is the entire tool belt itself. So verbal behavior, we're going to talk a lot about verbal behavior today, um, is the, um, the approach or the idea that um, Verbal behavior is um, re behavior that is reinforced by other people. So any behavior that you engage in when a reward or a desirable outcome or however you want to think about it, whenever your situation is improved because of what someone else does, that can be considered as verbal behavior. The verbal behavior can take many different forms, so it does not need to be vocal. Okay? Verbal behavior can be in the form of gestures. It can be in the form of um, written language, artwork, so when we talk about verbal behavior, a lot of the time, we might mean vocal behavior, but we don't always mean vocal behavior. Verbal does not mean vocal. And this is um, an approach that adds to teaching skills um, with children with autism. The verbal behavior approach has been widely successful. And um, language is treated, this is the, 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 another fundamental thing here, is that language is treated as behavior that can be shaped reinforced in occasions um, just as any other type of human behavior, just as nonverbal behavior can. So the focus is not on what, not only on what the student is saying, but why. So the function or the controlling variables that are responsible for that behavior that is occurring. Verbal behavior, um, <clears throat> when Skinner described it in 1957, um, it's quoted by Dr. Sonberg in 2014. Um, the main premise is that language is learned behavior. It's not some sort of accidental, inherited trait that humans have. It is learned behavior um, that is controlled by the environment. And traditionally with language, people have um, looked at uh, measuring the length of the response, the vocabulary size, the types of nouns and verbs that individuals use. But what's important in verbal behavior is the unit of analysis, or the ABCs, the antecedents, the behavior, and the consequences that are controlling behavior that helps us to define, understand, and appreciate, and therefore change and improve um, the language of individuals um, on the spectrum. So we use the term verbal operance a lot when describing behavior, um, different types of verbal behavior. Um, you can think about this as different categories of verbal behavior, and really the main summary of the take-home point um, for those who are unfamiliar with this topic is that each verbal operant serves a specific purpose or occurs for a different type of reason. And I'm going to go through the primary ones here. So I know Dr. Wentz is going to talk a lot about man's, and I'm going to discuss this in my work as well. A man is a basic type of verbal operant. Um, that we can essentially summarize as when an individual asks for something that he or she wants. So the, the also known as a request, a command, etc. So the important thing here to note when I'm talking about the antecedent's behavior and consequences is that the antecedent in demand is that the student wants something. So there's what we would call an establishing operation from a behavior analytics standpoint, or you could talk about a need, or a want, or a desire, there's the need, that want, desire, or establishing operation that's present. Then the individual engages in some form of behavior, so they perform some action, and that action produces a change in the environment that um, produces what he or she has wanted. Okay, so for example, if I was really thirsty, and actually I'm becoming kind of parched right now, and I look to Dr. Raspoli and I say, may I have some water? And if Dr. Raspoli were to come over to me and give me the water, that would be considered a demand because it was um, before my behavior, it was an establishing operation or a need or a want for something. I engaged in a response, 
and the outcome that was provided by somebody else produced something that satisfied that need. Now, if I walked over and just grabbed the water and drank it myself, that wouldn't be verbal behavior. It would still be satisfying this um, establishing operation here, but because my behavior was not reinforced by someone else, it would not be considered as verbal behavior. Other examples of demand, um, can I have a cookie? If you were to ask for a cookie and someone would provide that to you, that would be an example of a man. If somebody was doing something um, obnoxious or annoying and you asked them to stop and that individual did stop, that would be another example of a man. Um, and then the third example here, where are my shoes? I think I asked myself that this morning when I was trying to get ready. Um, you know, I'm looking for something, I have a need for something. I engage in that response and somebody helps me find it. So. The next um, fundamental or basic form of verbal operant is the tax. So this can be thought about or conceptualized as naming or identifying objects, actions, events, um, labeling something. And the controlling variables here are different. What's important to note that the antecedent no longer is an establishing operation or a, or a need or a want for something. It's that the student sees something or an individual sees something. They engage in a behavior and then that person, the reinforcer or the consequence, the change in the environment that increases the future probability of their behavior is social acknowledgement. Okay? So the primary benefit of the tact is not really for the person who's speaking, but it's for everybody else around him or her. So for example, I may say to, again to Dr. Rispoli, there are some pencils in the back in case you need to do any writing. And Mandy may say, oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that information. Now Mandy knows that, that's, that that is available for her to be able to use. And again, that was something that we did earlier today because she was looking for um, something to write with. Um, I may say, oh, you know, it's a really, really cold day inside this um, uh, workshop. I don't know if you guys are freezing or feeling a little chilly. That is a tact. I'm pointing something out to you, and, and it probably didn't take that um, tact for you to be able to notice that. But again, you benefit from that information. And your smiles and your nods, the social approval is what reinforces my verbal behavior. So other examples, I may say, that's a cookie, I see a bird, I see a toy, and your social approval to me is what controls or reinforces that behavior. An introverbal is another type uh, verbal operant, and this is can, can be thought about answering questions or having conversations where your words are controlled by other people's words. So for example, the, here, again, the controlling variable is different. The antecedent, or the thing that comes before the behavior, is someone else's verbal behavior. You engage in verbal behavior that is different than that antecedent, and then the student gets social acknowledgement, approval, or the conversation continues. So for example, someone may say, the antecedent, what is it? The verbal behavior may be, it is a bird, and then the um, consequence would be social approval and acknowledgement. Someone may say, how old are you? Again, that's the antecedent, someone's verbal behavior. You may say, I'm four, and then again, the student gets social approval and acknowledgement. Again, just to demonstrate the different controlling variables of these different verbal operands. And then another important verbal operand is the echoic, so repeating what is heard. So this might be, again, thought of as echoing or repeating something. The antecedent in this case, again, verbal behavior. But the difference here between the introverbal and the echoic is that the student's verbal behavior is the same. So it matches what they heard previously. And again, the consequence here is the same as the um, introverbal, where the student gets acknowledgement and social approval. So this is, if you're trying to teach somebody to say bird, and they say bird, that is an example of an echoic. Likewise, if you're trying to get somebody to say shoe, and they say shoe, and they receive social reinforcement, that is another example of an echoic. Other types of terminology that we may discuss during this workshop, so motor imitation, so repeating um, physically what someone else is doing, 
textual responding, which is reading and vocally reading aloud of um, someone up, of some written verbal behavior, transcription, spelling, copying text. So transcription is writing what is heard. Um, copying a text um, is another form of imitation. And then we talk about listener responding, often termed receptive labeling or receptive responding. And this is um, can be thought of as getting somebody or have, teaching somebody to follow directions. So we're going to talk about receptive um, labeling receptive object to matching um, a little bit later on, and this is bringing someone's behavior under the control of, of cues, gestures, other types of visual stimuli to engage in um, certain types of responding or desirable types of responding that you as a teacher have identified. So, just one last um, demonstration of the importance of um, functional independence with verbal behavior, verbal behavior, excuse me, before I pass it on. Is we have an example here where we have an antecedent where a student wants a bear, the student engages in the vocal response bear, and then the student gets a bear. Given the information we provided earlier, or given your knowledge about verbal behavior, what type of a verbal operant may this be? What's that? Man, absolutely. In another example, the student may see a bear, the student says bear vocally, and then the teacher says, yeah, that's right, that is a bear. What type of verbal operant may this be? Tap, absolutely. And then in the third example, the teacher may say, what is your favorite animal? And the student says bear, and then the teacher acknowledges the student is right. What type of verbal operant may this be? Yeah, an interverbal. So what is important here to note is that the vocal response or the behavior was the same in all three instances. But the controlling variables, the antecedents and the consequences are completely different. And highlighting our need to, to um, be mindful and thoughtful when we conceptualize language and we're thinking about skill acquisition to really tune into the controlling variables and pay closely attention to the antecedents and consequences. With early learners on the spectrum, Mans, tax, intraverbals, they all need to be taught separately for the specific response bear in order to really build or bring the, um, the learner's language um, under the appropriate types of control. So just because I learned to man for a bear does not mean that when I see what I'm going to say bear and that when my teacher says, what is your favorite animal, I will also say bear. That being the point there. So. That concludes my section for the introduction. I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Wendt.